So in the last session, we've been talking about uh, extending a, a integral domain to a field. And we found that we can construct a field from a uh, integral domain. And uh, the field that we constructed from an integral domain contains uh, the elements that can be expressed as a quotient of elements from integral domain. So our next attempt is uh, to establish the uniqueness of this field. This field, by the way, is called field of quotients, field of quotients. So the first result what we are going to show towards the uniqueness of the field of quotients is that if there exists a field containing the integral domain, then we can find an isomorphism from the field, the field of quotients to a subring of the field or the subfield of the field. So the result is like this. Let D be an integral domain and F its field of quotients. If L is a field containing D, then there exists a map psi from F to L that gives an isomorphism morphism from F to psi of F and psi of a comma 1 is equal to a or a in so it is a very straightforward result what it says is we have an integral domain and we have a field of quotient we have a field of quotient this is a field of quotients of this integral domain if at all we have a field that contains this and that is L, then we can find a subfield of this such that there exists a isomorphism from F to this subfield. This is actually phi of So the definition of, so define the map. It is actually partially defined here, but uh, this is only for elements from D, but we need to still uh, define for the whole of F. So define the map psi from F to L by 
See, L is a field containing D. This is our D. Right? So, elements of F is written as the class of the class containing a nodded pair and that is equal to A times B inverse. This operation is the multiplication in L. So this is actually A by B. So our claim is that um, this is a homomorphism and psi is 1, 1. That is what we want to prove. We prove that one, the psi is 1, 1 and it is a homomorphism. So in order to show that it is a homomorphism, what we need to do is phi of a comma b uh, plus c comma d is equal to what is this? This is actually psi of a D plus B C comma or you can write it directly comma uh, B D. And that is equal to by the, by the definition it is A D plus B C times B D inverse. Sorry, B D uh, B D inverse. That's right, and that is equal to A D B D inverse plus B C B inverse D inverse. This is actually inverse. See, this is actually the B D inverse is D inverse B inverse, but the same as this. We can actually we can write this is D inverse and B inverse. So because uh, um, the multiplication is commutative, this is equal to 1. So this is actually B inverse, AB inverse, plus this goes, this is actually cancelled. So it will be D, B inverse. Right? Now we'll see, um, so this is actually equal to psi of a comma b because psi of a comma b is a b inverse plus psi of c comma okay so this is um, psi of a comma b plus c comma d is equal to psi of a comma b plus psi of c comma d then the next we have to prove that a comma b times c comma d equal to this is psi of a c comma b d and that is equal to the definition a c times b d inverse and that is equal to a c D inverse, B inverse. And that is equal to A, B inverse times C, D inverse. And that is equal to Psi of A comma B times Psi of C comma.
So this is really a, a, a homomorphism. Now we need to show that it is one one. So let us assume that psi of a comma b is equal to psi of uh, c comma d. And what does that imply? That implies a b inverse is equal to c d inverse. Right? And that implies a d is equal to b c. And that implies ordered pair a b is related to ordered pair c d. And that implies a b is equal to the class c d. And that implies psi is 1 1. So there exists a 1 1 homomorphism from F to a subfield of uh, L. Now we need to show that this is also true. And that is evident because the psi of a comma b a comma 1 is equal to a times 1 inverse and that is equal to a. So that completes the proof. And there is a, a corollary to this uh, result. If a field L contains an integral domain D, then it contains a field of quotient of This is very clear uh, what we have done here is um, if L contains D then there exists an isomorphism from the field of quotient F to a subfield of to a subfield of L. And that subfield subfield is the uh, field of quotient is a field of quotient of that is if you are using the previous result otherwise Since the field of quotient of D contains the um, equivalent classes of A, B, where A, B different from zero. that implies L contains uh, the field of quotient. Because if A comma B belongs to D and B different from zero implies that 
a b inverse belongs to m and that implies this is nothing but the class containing a comma b that implies l contains Either way, we can show that L, L contains the field of quotient. We have one more corollary, and that establishes the uniqueness of the fields of quotients of a, an integral domain. And the corollary is like this. The fields of quotients of an integral domain are isomorphic. This establishes the uniqueness of fields of quotients. So what we'll do is let F1 and F2 be fields of quotients of an integral domain D. And that implies F1 contains D and F2 is a field of quotient. of D. So is using that result, there exists an isomorphism uh, isom from uh, isomorphism psi 1 from F2 to a subfield of And if you swap F1 and F2, similarly, there exists an isomorphism psi 2 from F1 to subfield of F2. And this means that um, psi 2 after psi 1 is a is the identity is the identity map on f2 and psi 1 after psi 2 is the identity on f1 and that implies F1 is isomorphic to F1. Now let us start the topic on the rings of polynomials. When we talk about a polynomial in elementary algebra, uh, what we have it in mind is that there is a variable called x and any finite expression of the form probably 5x squared plus 6x minus 1 is a polynomial. Here, the coefficients of all powers of x are coming from set of integers. So this is the idea behind, uh, uh, you know, when we, when behind us when we talk about a polynomial. We are doing the same thing, but in a slightly different, we are taking a slightly different approach to this. Now we know 
a ring can, any ring can behave like an integer or a rational number. Rational number. These coefficients can come from a ring. But our ultimate goal is to find or solve this polynomial equation. Okay, we will not call it as a polynomial equation later on. But we want to find out the value of x satisfying this equation. In that case, the coefficient and the value which value of x that is coming from may be different. See, if you take x minus 3 as a polynomial and uh, the coefficients we are considering, uh, coefficient that we are considering is coming from c, of course the value of x is coming from c, x is equal to 3. But if you take another polynomial f of x, 2x minus 3, then coefficients are coming from g, but x is coming from t. So we are not sure where this value is coming from. So, the, 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 so because of that, we are not going to use the term variable. Instead, we are going to use a term called in determinate indeterminate and the polynomial here is a finite sequence of um, a finite sequence of powers of indeterminate with this coefficient but the problem with that is, <coughs> um, see, if you take uh, 0x cubed plus 5x squared minus 6x plus 2, and 5x squared plus 6x plus 2. If you consider these two polynomials, if you take, say that it's a finite sequence of finite sum of uh, elements like this, these are two different elements. But we want to consider these two as same. So for that, our definition of a polynomial is not going to be a finite sum. We are going to define it as an infinite sum with only finite number of co coefficients that are zeros. So with this, this, these two things in mind, we are just changing the way we are dealing with polynomials. The variable is called indeterminate and a polynomial is not a finite sequence but an infinite sequence. Now let us define a polynomial over a field. Let R be a ring. A polynomial on an indeterminate determinate x is an infinite sum of the following form. Sigma zero to infinite i ai x to the power of i where 
x to the power of 0 is equal to 1, ai belongs to r. And ai is equal to 0 for all but finite number of i's. So this coincides with our finite sum. So the zero actually, and uh, bef before that, the collection of all these polynomials are or is denoted by R of x. And we are going to prove that this is a ring. But right now, let us assume that it's just a collection for the definition. So 0 actually belongs to R of x. is called a 0 polynomial. If f of x belongs to r of x and f of x is different from 0, then there exists an ai such that ai is greater than 0. If all the ais are 0, then it is called 0 polynomial. If, if uh, we have one ai is greater than z zero, then it is not any zero problem. In which case, um, the degree of f of x is the highest value of i such that ai is greater than meaning that is the coefficient of the highest exponent of the indeterminate. Okay. Now, R actually, R is the ring, is a subset of R of X. Because this is when um, we don't have any non-zero AIs where I is greater than zero. Okay? Is called the constant polynomial. Meaning any 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 value from R. A, just A, belongs to R, is a constant polynomial. Here what happens is A x to the power of 0. So the degree of the constant polynomial is 0. The degree of a constant polynomial is zero. Now let us define two binary operations on this uh, collection of polynomials. So let R be a ring and R square bracket x be the collection of polynomials on x over r. Define addition and multiplication
on r of x as follows. f of x comma g of x belongs to r of x then addition is f of x uh, where here we'll say f of x is equal to sigma i is equal to 0 to infinite a i x to the power of i and g of x is equal to um, sigma i is equal to 0 to infinite b i x to the power of i then f of x plus g of x is equal to sigma i is equal to 0 to infinite um, c i x to the power of i where c i is equal to a i plus b i and f of x plus g of x sorry times g of x f of x times g of x multiplication is defined by i is equal to 0 to infinite di xi where di is equal to sigma 0 to n ai b n minus i this is a normal definition of polynomial multiplication and addition the exponent of each of these uh, coefficient, the exponent of the determinant of with this each of this coefficient will be n. Now, with these binary operation, R of x is a ring. I'm not going to show every ring axioms here, but the additive identity is the zero polynomial. And uh, multiplicative identity is the constant polynomial one and if d is an integral domain so is d of x and if f is a field still uh, f of x is an integral domain this is not if f is a field still f of x is not an integral domain sorry if f of x is not in a field it's still an integral domain f of x is not a field when f is a field is because the polynomial x does not have a multiplicative inverse Okay. Now let us define um, the ring of polynomials with uh, multiple indeterminants. So let R be a ring. And R of X is the ring of polynomial on X 
power r. When we can consider, then we can consider another ring of polynomials. on another determinant y with coefficients from r of x because this is again a ring so that means r of x of y so that is actually equal to sigma i is equal to 0 to infinite a i y to the power of i where a i i's are polynomials. So this can be denoted as can be denoted as r square bracket x comma y and that is same as r of y comma x because we can rearrange the coefficients of x and y. So extending this definition for n number of indeterminates, indeterminates are x1 comma dash at xn is a ring of polynomials over uh, x1 dash at xn and 